as the summers come you will find these classes in the eastern command uh, eastern command area of uh, runachal and uh, sikkim areas the statement which the prime minister gave in the uh, in the uh, in the uh, seo summit it clearly i mean how can you have intelligence sharing with pakistan it's ridiculous even for terrorism mm. how do they get it but not by picking up a picking up a conventional fight look at what they did at galwan i call this as a brinkmanship warfare they will take you to that level and then just come back and it is competing for global leadership come 2049 which is the stated goal of uh, xi jinping for the fishing vessel they are saying they are vessels taking shelter against rough seas yes this is called gray zone this is called gray zone they have mass 200 sh- uh, vessels what are 200 vessels doing in uh, next to philippines for your information from 2014 to 2020 10 vessels have been rammed by the uh, these militia 10 vessels 2019 Uh, was the Philippines 2020 was Vietnamese? Mm-hmm. They have picked up their irritants in the South China Sea. Hello and welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adi Achin. Today I am privileged and proud to present you Lieutenant General Dushyant Singh, who is going to be talking about the Chinese belligerence in the oceans that we can see around us. The Lieutenant General was commissioned into the Ninth Battalion of the Mahar Regiment in the Indian Army in December 1981. During the course of his career with the Indian Army, he commanded a corps in Punjab. He was the Chief of Staff in the Eastern Command and was uh, has the distinction of having served twice with the National Security Guard or the NSG. Once as the Deputy Inspector General and the second time as the Inspector General. The Lieutenant General after that retired as the Commandant of the Army War College. So, with this immense experience behind him, thank you, sir, for joining us today and uh, agreeing to share your thoughts and views about some of the questions that I have prepared for you. Thank you, Adi, and uh, very good evening to your viewers. Good evening to you as well, sir. So, we'll start off with the recent Chinese action that we can see in the ocean. uh there's been a lot which has been discussed about the south china sea as per se my questions aren't really about that my question the first question that i like to ask you is about the latest chinese standoff using the naval militia and i'm using this word very very carefully close to the philippines what do you think is happening there sir uh adi uh, before i answer that question about the naval militia as you said uh being used of the coast of philippines uh it would be interesting to compare china vis-a-vis india and the us so i would like uh, to focus your attention on uh, the map of the south asian continent along with that you will have the map of uh, the indo pacific part of it at least seen uh mostly what happens in india is that we start looking at things from south to north perspective right and uh, we get caught somewhere in the middle of uh, two contested borders a uh, minor irritants here and there between the various uh, neighboring countries of ours somehow we lose focus what is there to the south of us if we just turn our map the other way around and start looking at uh, kanyakumari instead of looking at the uh, north you will realize that india somewhere down the line after independence has missed a golden opportunity i think historically also other than chola and shivaji uh, and the british india of course we have really not exploited the seas now if you look at china i am coming to your question which you asked if you look at china on the face of it you can see that it has got two uh, seas in front of it the south china sea and the east china sea but if you analyze it carefully it has got 14 nations around it it has resolved its borders with almost 12 of them only two are left india and bhutan and for obvious reasons you know why uh, it has left that issue simmering because it needs some kind of a leverage 
But the two seas which it has got, the East China Sea and the South China Sea, which are the uh, East China Sea is a gateway to Pacific, but the South China Sea is a gateway to the Indian Ocean. Both are contested. So technically speaking, who is landlocked? It's China which is landlocked. And since China is landlocked and it is energy hungry and it is competing for global leadership come 2049, which is the stated goal of uh, Xi Jinping, it has to somehow control the South China Sea and the East China Sea. East China Sea, I would say it's more of an alternative option if they are able to develop some kind of connectivity through the Northern Hemisphere. But the South China Sea definitely gives it the edge of either going towards the Pacific or going toward the Indian Ocean region. Uh, with this overall background in mind, the action in the Philippines, in my view, was justified uh, by the Chinese perspective. And hence this uh, effort of his to control South China Sea, it has uh, evolved a number of methods to do so, uh, which we will discuss as we go ahead later. Uh, so uh, uh, this, in my view, is the major reason why it has started doing what it is doing in the South China Sea, and now Philippines is the target. What are the reasons for Philippines being uh, addressed by the Chinese uh, are a different set of uh, issues. So we can discuss that as we go. Now you go ahead. Uh, sir, if I may just break down what you're trying to say is that we've been purposefully kept busy in the northern borders by the Chinese over a long period of time since I would say 1962 after the war. Uh, Purposefully to keep us away from the ocean, because that's where the action is. Would you agree to something like that? Sir? Absolutely, that's what I'm trying to uh, uh, get at. If you look at the Indian Ocean region, you know, Persian Gulf and the Malacca Strait are the two key areas, you know, of where uh, things happen. If you look at, say, uh, the uh, uh, the major powers, especially the U.S., maintain a visible and a credible presence in this region. Mm. Uh, there are three straits where key traffic flows. Uh, India juts almost 1980 kilometers into the IOR. 50% of the IOR basin is within 1500 kilometers. We have really not exploited this. And China is aware of it. So why should it allow China to, uh, why should it allow India to actually look southwards? I'm glad that the uh, government has announced the maritime command, and that probably will give us that Philip which is required to develop a military capability to ensure that we are able to control this region. Some of the figures are very mind-boggling. Malacca Strait, 60,000 vessels and 10 million barrels per day. That's the kind of traffic only of the oil. I'm not even talking of the uh, other trade uh, vessels which go through it. Look at the Persian Gulf, 5,500 vessels per day. It is something which is uh, which you and me can't even think of. Mm. When you see the map in an ops room of a of a of a maritime force, the area is like as though earthworms are crossing through these uh, straits. This is the reason why the Chinese are actually trying to divert India, get us into Makander and avoid the Mahan. Mahan is with us, but somehow we have not been able to. Uh, I'm, I'm referring to Mahan as the great thinker, you know, who, yes. who said that the power will flow through uh, the seas. The, the countries which control the seas will control the power. Mm -hmm. And Makander is the one who said the uh, countries which control the center will control the world. China is supposed to be the center of the world. That's another theory. So Philippines, in my view, was selected for two, three reasons. One, uh, the Chinese have already uh, consolidated the Paracelites. Mm. They have now made a city called Sensa City. They have declared it as a prefecture of China. So Paracels are more or less, uh, through an administrative process, part of the Chinese mainland. That is how they have declared it as a prefect of China. That means it's part of China. Spratlys, almost they are uh, at it. They are uh, controlling uh, uh, not as intimately as the Paracel Island, 
what that leaves are the the union bank reefs which are close to philippines <laughs> and hence the militia of of the uh, of the uh, chinese has started focusing on these reefs because if it is able to control the reefs it is the uh, uh, mineral and uh, mineral rich uh, resource out there so there and also it acts as a uh, listening post and a control point of the south china sea mm. that is one first reason the second reason is that if it threatens philippines or if it not threatens i would say if it brings uh, philippines under its ambit it is indirectly undermining the us influence because us and the philippines have a arrangement there is another very major issue which you and me probably don't know is that there is a code of conduct negotiations which are going on between the asean uh, asean nations and china philippines is the leader of that mm -hmm. now china would like to have a code of conduct which is against its interests so what best way to do is the country which is leading this negotiations to be got under control these are the three major reasons which i feel are responsible for uh, the chinese action in the philippines that's very interesting sir one can actually see a pattern emerging by how you explaining this entire thing uh one of the biggest thing that is coming out in this past couple of years is that india is going to be one of india actually is not going to be it has become one of the countries that is going to stand up to china uh when its own interests and other things are uh, threatened when we see a country like china picking on a country like philippines by by a very layman's language when you're talking about uh, it consolidating its entire south china sea region step by step as you explained it one can actually see the uh, pattern emerging but for a layman sir when a layman looks at philippines he understands philippines to be a weaker country not very uh, forward in terms of its military and stuff like that so chinese are picking up the 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 weakest link in that entire area after getting their face blackened by india over here so is this somewhere that the chinese are also trying to cover up for their min military misfortune uh to some extent you are uh, right adi but uh, i would put it to a larger game hmm. as i had alluded earlier itself they are keeping two major aims in their mind they know at the global level it is the us which has to be supplanted by 2049 which is a stated goal of xi jinping hmm. right 2049 is the 100th year of the ccp uh once they came to power in 1949 so that's one of their stated aims the second big problem which they have is india right because at the regional level if they are not able to uh impress upon their leadership how can they impress their leadership at the global level mm -hmm. so they have to fix india which is the only force or only country which is available or which is present in this region which can actually uh contest china right now if this is their broad goal they would like to place or show place to india where it belongs mm. and also control the gateways to becoming a a global leader philippines etc are the gateways or those small irritants which it has to remove so what it is doing is uh, it also knows that economically if they are not strong they cannot really reach this goal so early us took 200 years to become a global power now for these uh, for the chinese they need that space of economic well being economic prosperity you are aware they have they have uh, uh, they have stated their goal very clearly eradication of poverty by 2020 was their actual aim and then becoming a prosperous uh, nation by 2025 and then becoming a global leader by 2049 these are laid out uh, documented aims of the chinese now to achieve this they need the money power mm. how do they get the money power not by picking up a picking up a conventional fight look at what they did at galwan i call this as a brinkmanship warfare they will take you to that level and then just come back mm. it is some people refer to it as two steps forward one step backwards policy of the chinese but i call it as a brinkmanship and they have learned it from the north koreans incidentally 
this uh, brinkmanship, uh, especially during the Trump and the uh, uh, Trump era. So uh, they are deliberately not picking a fight with the uh, Indians. They are actually part of its salami slicing. Some people call it as plus salami slicing tactics. Even today, what they have done, they have been able to actually achieve the major concern of theirs of the Indian Army or Indian Armed Forces withdrawing from the Kailash Ranges. So their one major uh, uh, issue which could have troubled them in the future has been achieved. So therefore, the, they have kind of partially achieved their aim. I won't say that they have uh, achieved what they had set out for. Doklam, they had a uh, they had a black face. Similarly, in the uh, current imbroglio, also they had a black face. But the border border talks which are going on, the recent one, even on the ninth, which took place, it just ended up with let's move forward, let's talk, and let's resolve the other areas of. Uh, so they will continue like this for some while and show actions in the south, the southeast or the South China Sea. Mm-hmm. Now, in my view, it's also an overall game plan, and second. Uh, it is also uh, due to some gallant action. At the tactical level, we are very strong. India actually cannot be beaten at the tactical level by the Chinese. And the Chinese have realized this twice over, Doklam and uh, Galwan. Uh, um, in future, uh, it will not be actions of this nature. That's my reading, at least in the next uh, 10 to uh, 15 years. They will continue to do these small little uh, border uh, transgressions, as I like to call them. So uh, it's part of the this is part of the game plan also, and to some extent, India is responsible for showing them their place uh, at the tactical level. So moving on, I just want to ask you: it's a uh, it's a thought process that has been discussed quite a bit, and a lot of people have written about it as well. You've written about the Quad as well. I personally yeah. feel and post a bit of discussion around. Uh, some circles. I personally feel the Quad will not be able to put a certain effect on China unless and until the ASEAN countries get involved. Um, is the push of the Chinese towards the Philippines currently also a message to the ASEAN countries that please don't get involved in this business or we will have to you know, take actions as uh, required for their own interests? Uh, that's a thought uh, which is worth considering. But uh, uh, recently, Indonesia gave a statement mm. saying that the Quad must uh, incorporate the interests of the Southeast Asian nations. So I think there is uh, there is this cur- undercurrent going on uh, between the Quad countries and the Chinese to actually get the uh, 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 Southeast Asian nation on their side. Mm. But... Uh, to say that Quad is the primary reason why they have uh, uh, targeted Philippines uh, may be part of the part of the reasoning, but not the only reasoning. I think uh, the Chinese will be worried with the Quad only when it gets militarized. Mm. Right? The Quad currently still remains a grouping which is more focused towards the oceans. Uh, freedom of uh, movement, uh, global issues, environmental issues, and that's what has been stated by even Biden. Till the time we have a militarized agreement between the four countries, and my take is that the four countries are not enough. Mm. Like you said, we need to uh, take on board the ASEAN, we need to take on board France. Because if if any other any country other than uh, these four can influence this region, I think France has that in them to actually turn the tables against uh, China. And that too, uh, operationalization of Quad is a must. Till the time Quad is not operationalized uh, like NATO, uh, I may be, uh, I may be uh, contested on that issue because a lot of people uh, don't like to compare Quad with NATO. Yes. But my, my, take, my take is that uh, unless we militarize Quad, Quad will not be that effective in terms of deterring China uh, militarily. It might, it might, uh, it might force it to compromise on certain economic issues, etc. Fine, that's uh, that's okay. So that's my view uh, as far as this uh, question of yours is concerned. Sure. 
So you spoke about two things in uh, the past couple of answers you've given. One, you've talked about the bigger picture that the Chinese have. God alone knows what that picture is. But the bigger picture that the Chinese have, that's point number one. Point number two is they always try and uh, do something that, in their opinion, is their right. But it does bring about a lot of negative attention towards China. Um, Yes, the Indian uh, standoff brought in a lot of negative attention to a point. The French actually said, "We are ready to come and help you out." The Philippines is bringing about a backlash. Um, there, there's there is always a backlash to the Chinese steps. Do you think this is a calculated risk that the Chinese are taking, or what is it? I mean, it's it's very difficult to kind of place it, sir. Um, if you if you look at the the, the larger gray game which you which uh, which I just spoke about. Uh, in this, I would like to uh, tell you something about the fact, the way the Chinese think. Chinese still think in concentric circles, despite the fact that it was an old concept under the Qing Dynasty, which uh, assumed that China was the center of the world and it was the heaven, and rest of the people were supposed to pay uh, uh, tributes to them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But Xi Jinping has actually modified that concept to seven concentric circles very beautifully. In fact, uh, Kevin Rudd has uh, written about it. Uh, and one of my professors in the US, uh, he is a former uh, CIA uh, operative and uh, a professor now by, uh, by choice uh, of deterrence. Uh, he says that these seven concentric circles are first that the Chinese would like to maintain the primacy of CCP. That will explain to you why the CCP will drive the military to achieve its aim. That is one, which will, what is happening, what you just referred to. The second is that they would like to emphasize on the on the uh, areas away from their core. Their core is, of course, the Hans, right? The areas away from the core are Xinjiang, Tibet, uh, Mongolia, these are the areas they would like to unite with them. Then the third circle is their peripherals, which are the 14 nations. They would like to keep them at bay. 12, they have already sorted out. Two, they keep it for leveraging. And that is here, I would say, there is a game which they are playing. The fourth is the environment, of course, because they are growing rapidly. And they have to ensure that while growing, China doesn't suffer to the environmental uh, hazards which... Uh, which will happen to it. Imagine the kind of oil which goes to China, etc. It is creating problems from, for them in the environmental uh, area. And the fifth is in the regional domain. That is the maritime domain. And sixth and seventh are at the global level. Uh, seventh being finally supplanting the US as the global leader. So as you see, the outermost concentric circle is still far away. Mm. They are still looking at their fifth circle, which is the uh, maritime domain, and the fourth circle, which is the uh, the land frontiers where India and so unless they cross this, they are not going to rock the boat. Let me tell you. In order to achieve this, they have selected gray zone as their strategy. Hmm. Right. Now, what happens in a gray zone? Gray zone is an area which is neither peace nor war. So what are the tactics which they will employ? Confrontation with India without weapons. Have you ever heard of uh, a border clash taking place where no weapons are used? It's a planned strategy of that nation. Now you see the South China Sea. They are quietly militarizing their militia and their fishing vessels with the capability to ram, vehicle, uh, ram vessels of the Southeast Asian nations. For your information, from 2014 to 2020, 10 vessels have been rammed by the uh, these militias. 10 vessels. 2019 uh, was the Philippines. 2020 was Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. They have picked up their irritants in the South China Sea. So therefore, I feel it's part of their game plan. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. They have been blackened, as you rightly said, uh, in the face by the Indians. And that actually goes to the advantage of India to prove to the world that we are the only ones who can stand up to the, to the Chinese. The Philippines have been trying it very meekly. The president is actually not 
having the uh, dumps they have gone into uh, agreement with india for supply of the brahmos etc uh, and india has in fact offered them a 100 million uh, uh, line of credit also which they have said that we don't want it and we will buy it off the uh, self and likewise all these southeast asian nations are negotiating from brahmos they have already gone in for those protective equipment etc which they are already buying armor plating etc they are already buying uh, i i have a feeling that it's part of again their gray zone warfare in which sometimes they are successful and sometimes they are not in my view in south china sea they have been successful mm. as far as the indian frontier goes i think they have met their match now so negativity has to be taken in the stride of a gray zone warfare mm. and that is why the gray zone is being played the way where they can deny things you know negativity can be denied for the fishing vessel they are saying they are vessels taking shelter against rough seas yes this is called gray zone this is called gray zone they have massed 200 uh, vessels what are 200 vessels doing in uh, next to philippines oh they say that you know the seas were rough so they had to be all taken to a place where there was a shelter so they all gone and massed there the issue will fizzle out after a, after a while but slowly they will establish their control over the union bank reefs and after 5 years the nation will come to know there is a uh, world will come to know there is a city like sensa city which has been uh, created in the south china sea it will be in my case, in my view a, a kind of an outpost of uh, china for controlling of the south china sea the this area where it is doing this action now. yeah Thank you. i agree with you so uh, we always talk about what china is doing there is there is but there is little talk about what india has to do back as a matter of fact we've seen various different actions being conducted by india uh, around this region as well one of the things that you mentioned is the negotiations with philippines for the brahmos negotiation with the other countries the southeast asian countries for brahmos plus other military equipment um it is obviously a very touchy topic for china and previously these things were happening happening is but not put out in the public domain for the fear that the chinese might get upset one of the things that came out into the public and although very very minuscule but it is quite surprising that india openly communicated with taiwan with regards to a conflict between chinese and the country of paraguay with regards to vaccines taiwan requested india to send some vaccines across and we did so and this was put out in the public domain one of the things that i want to bring about with this particular statement is that do you see that there is some amount of movement from the indian side towards the soft nerve points of the chinese evidently looking at the results that came out as you rightly mentioned of the core commander talks which are currently not going nowhere obviously either india or china is looking for an advantage somewhere so that some negotiations can happen but do you see that the indians have started up some sort of back end processes for the lack of a better word against the chinese with the countries that has a problem with i i think uh, you're right uh, absolutely true india is doing it but india is being uh, also conscious of the fact that it needs also the same space for the chinese need for its own economic prosperity so it is doing it very subtly and uh, there is no harm in doing so although there are many who say that we should now stop uh, honoring the one china policy we should start calling spade a spade if they are doing something in hong kong uh, then you know that should be uh, that should be expressed very clearly uh, while uh, we have uh, we have done so uh, not in a same manner as the other countries have been denouncing the uh, actions of the chinese but underhand you are right you know the fact that we are uh, see there are two purposes being served by all these actions first of all these countries why are they uh, flocking to india is because of the cost factor of the brahmos missile as compared to the other the second factor is brahmos by far as of today is the best in its class today in the world right so both the advantages they are getting now by doing this it is definitely sending a strategic signal that the areas where you thought it was your domain we have the capability to intervene mm-hmm. and uh, to 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 make matters worse for china even vietnam is negotiating with india 
even mm. Indonesia is negotiating with India, even Thailand is negotiating with India. So therefore, these countries never thought in these terms earlier. If you know, they were very peaceful countries. I've visited all of them. And they would always answer to me whenever I asked this question that, you know, why don't you have a very strong, they said we, a strong military. We don't require, we, we believe in a peaceful, uh, you know, existence in this part of the world. But they have realized that the world is not so peaceful as they think. And uh, slowly the Chinese have actually uh, pulled the rung, uh, rug from under their feet. So I think uh, these are strategic signals as well, besides uh, improving the India's export capability. So that is something where we need to actually work very strongly. Uh, and where the interests are conjoined, why not do it? Indians are doing it. I, the Quad is a big example of it. The statement which the Prime Minister gave in the uh, in the uh, in the uh, SEO summit, it clearly, I mean, how can you have intelligence sharing with Pakistan? It's ridiculous, even for terrorism. One of the provisions of SEO is that we will share intelligence related to terrorism. Can you think of India share, I mean Pakistan sharing uh, information about terrorism with India? So there are certain things which he called spade a spade mm. without mentioning China or Pakistan. I think uh, in my view, we are going correct. Maybe when we are a little more uh, militarily or when our hard power actually improves a little more, I think we would be able to uh, uh, speak uh, more clearly on these issues, more openly on these issues. Even on Myanmar, we have been very guarded in our statements, as you would have realized. Mm. Uh, we, we have... We have uh, called for restoration of democracy, but at the same time, we are maintaining a very low profile as far as Myanmar is concerned because our interests are involved there. So I, I think we are playing the game right. That's I, my take. I agree with you, sir. If you have a pack of cards, why would you want to show all your cards in the first one? Put it out Absolutely. one by one when it's required. I agree with you. Absolutely, sir. Definitely. Sir, there's another thought process that, uh, you know, this particular thing kind of keeps me uh, thinking quite a while. As a matter of fact, uh, one thing that seems pretty evident with regards to what the Chinese have gone through in the past one year, militarily speaking, the leadership, of course, the army is a private army of the Chinese Communist Party. We all know that. The leadership of the Chinese Communist Party seems to be a little frustrated with regards to the results uh, of the military actions that the PLA, PLAAF or the PLA Navy has been undertaking. And one can also say it's the other way around as well. It's the PLA, uh, all three branches of the PLA are also a little bit frustrated with the kind of missions and the kind of projects that the Communist Party of China has been putting in front of them. My question to you is that, sir, is the Chinese leadership purposefully doing this to keep the PLA away from the Chinese mainland, busy in their own things, so that they do not disturb the Communist Party's rule over China? Um, Adi, to some extent, you, you may be right. <clears throat> I would like to um, share a second-hand experience. I won't say a third-hand, uh, first-hand experience. On the issue of uh, Doklam, wherein the actions of the PLA theater commander uh, came under question. Hmm. We commonly believed that Doklam was an initiative of the uh, WC, WTC uh, theater commander uh, at that time uh, who, who actually uh, uh, undertook this action unilaterally. I am not very sure, but this is the feelers which we got uh, based on some interaction which was taking place in a track 1.5 uh, diplomacy on the sites. Right, between two people, uh, wherein uh, Zhao Zongki, who was the theater commander, possibly uh, without the knowledge of the CCP, took the action of Dokla. He had the interest of after retirement benefits or going moving into the Politburo or the, 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 the top body of the CCP. Unfortunately, the Doklam incident backfired very, very badly. That was the first time when the Indian media behaved the best. He was counting on the Indian media to raise a war hysteria. 
the indian media at that point in time i was uh, part of this thing when i was in the eastern command i was in fact so i found the indian media was actually well behaved at that point in time there was no war in syria people were being uh, things were being reported as they were on the ground and we took actions uh, uh, in a timely and a correct manner both at the strategic level and at the at the operational and tactical level um, by the army commanders of uh, the eastern army that time and i think uh, because of these two uh, actions doklam was a uh, uh, a failure as far as the chinese were concerned and this actually has pissed off the uh, ccp leadership this is my assessment i i may be wrong in this but you are right to some extent because i have some uh, indirect feelers on this issue too mm-hmm. some point and when galwan happened galwan also i believe was a was an attempt by uh, zonki zao zonki to actually redeem himself because he was about to retire mm. and galwan also failed miserably failed mm-hmm. wherein they had to actually hide their casualties till india announced the mahavir chakra etc to kan santosh babu and then they had to you know announce those four uh, four fallen chinese soldiers awards the chinese except that they don't they, they still didn't uh, actually uh, acknowledge the other casualties so somewhere they have actually got pissed off with the PLA at least I won't say whether they have got pissed off with the PLA Air Force or the PLA Navy, but definitely with the PLA Army uh, Western Theatre Commander they have been pissed off. That is why he was after he was replaced by Zhang Zudong. Uh, he has not been given. He has been sidelined. He has been just sidelined to the. I mean, I I think you are right on that count. Uh, they are they are not very happy with the PLA as of now, as at least as of today. Uh, hopefully uh, the new theater commander would be able to sort out the matters and that may be also one of the reasons why there is sudden amount of peace and tranquility along the uh, northern borders of course mm-hmm. uh, we we must pat ourselves at least here sure. would you say we the other way, would you say the other way around as well sir the pla is also not very happy with what is happening with regards to the way that the chinese leadership treated the whole galwan incident if there are some uh, undercurrents like this I, at least i won't venture to uh, uh, express my opinion because i really do not have the uh, have the information on this issue uh, you will always being or any any kind of an organization when things are not going your way you will try to blame uh, your superiors so okay. so if there is something like this happening one should not be surprised by it it is possible but whether it has taken a taken a uh, taken a shape of a major bickering i don't think so if it had happened uh, despite china being such a closed country iron iron curtain etc uh, we would have got to know about it there are some here and there reports but i won't put it uh, in the same bracket as uh, major mis- major uh, misunderstanding between the ccp and uh, and the uh, pla Uh, I don't know. So the point is, PLA, PLA in general may not be happy because they have been axed by two two uh, two lakh people have been uh, uh, you know removed and the navy and the air force have been actually upgraded, which is rightly so. I mean, India has to also somewhere now start developing towards our navy. You know, we have to build our naval capability, maritime capability. Yes. Correct, sir. So I'm going to ask you to future gaze a little bit. So India is pretty much. Uh, still in progress i personally feel that they are keeping this issue hanging because somewhere down the line they also want some advantage with india they cannot just let go of everything and uh, you know uh, so they cannot just let go of everything and land up with nothing in their hand to negotiate with india so they're going to keep this galwan area they're going to keep the hot springs and the debsang plain active as far as they can this is my personal reading of the situation sir philippines is happening where do you see the next chinese flashpoint i it's a question which uh, i have been pondering over uh, for quite some time uh, my take is they are going to keep the uh, northern border for the time being peaceful uh, at least for a year year and a half i think uh, they are going to let it uh, let it uh, settle down they may try to somehow 
normalize the occupation or normalize the uh, places where they are still holding on mm. as they have done in depsang as they have done in the past in the other areas where they have come in and sat down and uh, possibly uh, not moving out because those are all disputed areas where they have come and this by disputed area you mean that you know their perception of lc is somewhere else our perception of lac is somewhere else so so they are playing within this uh, this zone of uh, differing perceptions to keep on creeping ahead so this part of the creeping uh, strategy uh, they will try to continue to engage us in talks unless we find some great leverage to actually push them further uh, situation will remain as what it is there will be minor uh, clashes here and there as the summers come you will find these clashes in the eastern command uh, eastern command area of uh, arunachal and uh, sikkim areas uh, are likely to happen but uh, not to the level as to what we saw in the dalwan area to my mind the flash point is going to remain uh, in the seas and uh, possibly possibly the nine dash line being what uh, what they consider as their core interest uh, in fact i would like to quote from uh, their defense minister's uh, thing but it, uh, it was published in the national geography chinese national geography he says the nine dash line is now deeply engraved in the hearts and minds of the chinese people and the nine dash line has been converted to 10 dash line mm. where is the 10th dash it is not in south china sea it's going towards the east china sea wow okay so my take is 10th dash has still not been addressed maybe they will start looking at that area as i said concentric circles is their philosophy till they control senkaku formally as part of their area of control i think the japanese are going to see the next uh, flash point this is my uh, this is my uh, take on this i may be wrong uh, the other uh, option which the chinese have is that there are large tracts uh, you know which are disputed as far as the eastern sector is concerned in our uh, as far as india is concerned there are some very very strong flash points there and if uh, the chinese uh, uh, feel the way they are feeling that india has actually managed to come over on top of them twice in a row they may select one of those i would not not like to mention those because those are uh, uh, security classification uh, is involved in that suffice it to say that we need to be on guard even in our eastern sector uh, arunachal and sikkim area we have to be careful and nepal too a uh, chinese don't do anything without a without an aim or intention mm. why did they raise uh, libya dura and lipule after uh, so many years it was raised by the nepalese in 1991 yes and suddenly at the galwan uh, peak of galwan incident uh, nepalese were told okay you you issue a map you raise this issue of lipule after the chinese have signed a trade agreement with india uh, for trade and uh, mansarovar yatra so these are places we need to be focusing on uh, in the central sector i think we have to be uh, conscious of the fact of the nepalese uh, chinese and the indian tri junction area of lipu lake limpu adhara uh, which is already in the news so i am mentioning it mm. and the areas of uh, eastern theater where we have the uh, sikkim and arunachal areas where we have a number of uh, places where there are disputes where there are large tracts under dispute much larger than what you see what you have seen in the areas of uh, ladakh so uh, and 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 uh, so therefore uh, these are the three options which the chinese have uh, they will give themselves some time it could be either the senkaku area or it could be the the uh, areas of uh, uh, the central sector and the eastern sector so we need to be on guard on this could be the flash point i don't think they going to attempt anything bigger than that uh, biden is playing his card well i think he is promoting quad much better way than uh, what trump was doing by making the whole quad issue taking it to a level of leadership level which is at the summit level he has given a very clear message uh, to to the world that he means business as far as quad is concerned 
maybe right. not directly directly into the security concerns of india but definitely he means business at the indo pacific so china will remain uh, on guard mm. it will still remain in the gray zone let me put it this way it will still remain in that gray zone okay so one last question i mean when somebody reads your profile they read the nsg and uh, as much as mystery that surrounds this particular organization it is also the only time i guess the energy is seen is during the the public day parades after otherwise it's not even seen anywhere so may i request you throw, your, throw some light on your experience with this group uh, this such an elite group and what uh, how would you like to describe them okay um... as far as nsg is concerned it was supposed to remain under blankets the design of nsg was that it would only emerge in the event of a major major crisis right people should have that aura that you know a force has come black cat commandos have come nobody knew in the country that there was an sg existing till 1984 right special special group which was there nobody knew it was it was lying in a remote corner it used to do a lot of activities no one in the country knew except uh, possibly the then prime minister mrs indira gandhi right but after her death i think uh, they surfaced black cat black dresses were seen in the media and the idea germinated of uh, raising the national security guard uh, it's a it's a uh, a mixed force with 53% strength uh, being from the army and 47% strength being from the central police forces uh, it was also supposed to have some elements of the state police also but uh, uh, no major inputs from there because uh, for obvious reasons they do not meet the uh, physical criteria whenever even if they send some guys there they are actually turned back because of the physical capabilities which are required to actually conduct uh black cat commander uh, on a staff job they may have been there but not in the uh, in the fighting domain so that's as far as their composition is concerned uh, initially they were only in delhi right at uh, a place uh, close to delhi and uh, they had uh, two of the uh, army battalions which were known as special action group and uh, three uh, police uh, battalions they were known as the special rangers group the the distribution was that the 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 counter terrorism and counter hijacking tasks were taken over by the taken on by the by the special action group and which is the army and the uh, the security related jobs were taken on by the the srg or the special rangers group which were the police forces right uh mumbai happened and uh, when the mumbai effects were getting over i joined as dig officers and it was at that point in time that uh, we started working at the shortcomings of the mumbai operation the many many shortcomings which were observed both at the national level and at the level of the force and at the level of the uh, tactical level so all those uh, actions were taken so i was part of that journey of uh, reform of the nsg uh, certain things happened to your liking certain things happened uh, not to your liking but uh, it was decided that to cut short the response we must have the hubs uh, located in the country so the four hubs came up now there is a fifth hub in gujarat also so these hubs are supposed to be the first reaction to a crisis in a region of the country uh, related to counter terrorism and counter hijacking okay but the main action would still remain with delhi there in delhi still remains a, a, a task force which is kept at a very short notice which is uh, when i say short notice means within 2 hours it's airborne that's the that's the kind of notice which we have we have practiced it day in and day out uh, they can't be faltered on the those things those drills have been very beautifully uh, orchestrated organized and practiced rehearsed they are good at it let me tell you as far as this portion is concerned it is entirely entirely done by the army and uh, uh, there is a aircraft standby for uh, 
this kind of a job 24/7 so uh, our response definitely is very good uh, this was a lesson learned from mumbai a major lesson learned. because we got delayed uh, in mumbai by a hell of a lot of time we reached very very late by that time a lot of damage was taking place yes sir uh, then uh, the process of you know reform reorganization of the hubs has also started uh, the hubs are mixed unfortunately or fortunately whatever you may want to call it the the strike force of the hubs are mixed unlike the uh, unlike the uh, delhi force which is a pure army and uh, pure police the regional hubs are a mixed uh, composition of forces uh, they are supposed to bring the good points of each other and function my uh, i have a different uh, view on this it has invariably been found in our uh, our uh, indian way of uh, behavior that the bad spread faster than the good you know mm-hmm. so there is a, there is a tendency for the good guys also to become bad rather than the good guys making the bad guys good so uh, there is this uh, skepticism also uh, not expressed openly that the uh, they would still prefer the force from delhi to reach there faster and uh, do the action so the whole idea of keep making the hubs i think somewhere needs a little more uh, uh, refinement in terms of reorganizing the structure that's my personal view i have been opposed for it uh, both within the organization and outside the organization uh, that is one issue the second issue is uh, the composition of the force is 5347 right traditionally whenever there is an army force involved the commander is always from the army world over hmm. unfortunately in this case the commander is from the police forces and a lot of misunderstandings do take place uh, because of the uh, because of the the functioning differences both come from i am not saying that one is good or one is bad but I, what i am trying to say is that both of them come from a totally different uh, culture and marrying up at this level at the top level with the ig ops being from the army and the dg being from the uh, police uh, there at times are frictions it have it has happened in the past so one has to uh, go with a very very balanced uh, that's what that is the experience uh, which i have and i had to really balance it out uh, to ensure that uh, our, our 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 operations didn't suffer because of these mismatches in experiences of the two uh, leaders at the top level so that was my second big uh, observation as far as nsc is concerned the third big observation which i have is that which was started with a very good intention was that they must keep this force young always mm. right young means you know there there won't be any old guys in this organization so it doesn't have a permanent cadre oh it has a it has a 3 and a 5 year rotation uh, deputation so the police uh, personnel come for 5 years deputation and the army personnel come for 3 year in fact this was being reduced to 2 year also because of our own shortages etc right mm-hmm. but uh, uh, it is still being maintained at 3 years now what happens is that when you are practicing when you are organizing when you are doing things in a particular manner especially in a mixed organization especially where the regimentation is not there mm-hmm. unlike in rr where there are the same regiments which are sending the troops so there is a some kind of a captive knowledge available there right unfortunately in this case people come from all over they keep changing every 3 uh, months <coughs> mind you every 3 months they keep changing institutional memory suffers mm. of practice drills procedures how much and whatsoever sops you may write wars are not or battles and the operations are not done on sops purely yes. every 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 situation is different sops can just serve you as a guideline so therefore that institutional memory actually suffers in my view so my suggestion was always and i always kept telling uh, even up to the ministerial level that have a core cadre have a core permanent cadre which becomes that link between the guys who are coming on deputation and the guys who are who are, who are going to remain 
permanently there. So these these three major observations were what I felt that if they were addressed, the this force would become even more better and lethal. And uh, when there is a, a mixture of forces, air force, army, uh, police, and the NSG, who should be in command? The, the charter of NSG says that DG NSG would be in command. Hmm. But uh, the uh, the Red Book says, or or the Ministry of Defense uh, has uh, has got a document which says that whenever army comes in, army gets into command. We need to sort out this uh, this uh, uh, you know uh, uh, this this particular uh, I would say difference in the procedure at that level. At the lower level, of course, we did not allow it to affect the operation. We kept uh, mm. we kept them isolated from what was happening at that level, uh, at my level. But the fact is that I think there is a need for us to address uh, these four issues. Then I suppose um, the NSG will be a force to reckon, provided we do this. Otherwise, they are, they are very good in their task, right? Uh, and uh, my uh, impression is that uh, only thing is that they are restricted to urban mm. urban insurgency. So most of the time people keep telling why don't they go to the LWE area. They have not been trained for it. If we have to prepare them for LWE area, then they will no more remain a, a, a force or a commando force. Then you'll have to create a force like Cobra or for para commandos we have like uh, in the army, create a separate force out of them and make them enabled to operate in the LW. Mm. As of today, we took a few minor uh, exercises here and there just to uh, keep ourselves uh, trained to get uh, to react to a situation where we may sometimes get involved. But otherwise, it's a urban uh, counter-terrorism force and a counter-hijacking force for aircrafts. It has got a very, very clear-cut role. So common public done, generally doesn't understand that it is not meant for the LW. Mm. But you can create it for LW, then you'll have to create forces. We tried it out, in fact, a long time back when one of the SRG battalions was sent there. But then it, uh, it really could not... Uh, do anything much because it was not fully geared for it. So we have to, if you if you make a battalion geared for it, uh, we should be able to do it. But as of now, uh, the the demand that it should go for LWE is, I think, misplaced, misunderstood by the common public. So, so this is my broad. Uh, as far as organization structure etc is concerned, I've already told you what yes. it is. Yes. It, has a, it has a dedicated training center under a major general who actually looks at the induction process. And so the process is uh, quite uh, quite rigorous, I would say so. Overall, it's a it's a it's a a good force available to the government of India to be used. I feel it should be used more often. Otherwise it gets rusted. Yes. From 2008, from 2008, the next time it was used was in 2016. Mm -hmm. So, and before that, it was Akshar Dham in 2002. True, sir. I think I agree with you. Sir, I'd like to thank you so much for providing, uh, I think, a very balanced approach of what Chinese are doing today, one in the oceans and strategically around themselves. Um, I think the concept of the concentric circles will put a lot of people at ease uh, who cannot understand the whys of China. I think it's it's very important for us to know our, I won't call it an, an enemy, I would call it an adversary or a challenger for that matter. So thank yeah. you so much sir, for uh, you know providing the time and the effort uh, that you've put in to uh, explain to us the various aspects of what is happening around us with this a uh, belligerent nation. Thank you, Adi. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to you and uh, hope you succeed in your uh, ventures in the future as well. Thank Good you. luck to you. God bless you. Thank you, sir.